Before we sit, turn to your Bibles in the book of Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3. We've been exploring our scripture, uh, our theme verse, Advancing for Conquest. And I want to appreciate all the pastors, beginning with our resident pastor and the other pastors for the way they have built us and they have continued to progress on that portion of scripture. I believe you've been blessed by the ministry here the last month of January. So I will continue to pick it up from where we, they have left. And as I said in the first service, we will build on this until all of us are on our path to receiving our victory in 2024. And that will depend on how you receive the word of God and how you appreciate what is coming out from the Lord. So we are going to be looking at this scripture, Joshua 3.3, 3, in support of Arise, Go Over This Jordan, you and all these people to the land which I am giving to them. The word that God has given us for the year 2024. And I'm calling my topic for this morning, walking in step with God. Can somebody say that? Come on, I can't hear you. Perfect. Walking in step with God. We want to see how Israel walked in step with God. So let's read chapter 3, Joshua, and verse 3. And I'll do it, if you could just flash it up there, media. I'm going to do it in uh, KG, KJV. It says, and they commanded the people saying, let's go together. What did they say? When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. You know, King James is a little tough for people who don't understand English very well. The word remove has a good meaning. The word remove means moving, you know, arising and, and following. Can we do it in, a, in a e, 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 ESV, okay? Can we go together? And commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from the place and follow it. So remove means you do what? You will follow it. We have prayed. God bless you. You may be seated in God's presence. All right. Now, I will begin by posing a question. What do you think was the most important thing for Israel when they began their journey of crossing the Red Sea? I posed this question in the first service and I, I got an answer. Moses has died. Joshua has taken over. He's been commissioned, now, as we've been hearing from the scriptures here. The people have accepted Joshua. And these men and women are now ready to cross the river Jordan to the place that God is sending them. What do you think was the most important thing that these people needed to cross that river? In your opinion, what do you think it was? What was the most important thing? I want to hear from you, not those who've been here in the first service, because those ones can very easily answer. What was the most important thing that these people needed to cross the Red Sea? I mean, to cross the, the River Jordan. What do you think, church? What do you think? The presence of God. That's what I want to talk about here. The presence of God. That is the most important thing that these men needed or these women needed to cross over to the other side of the sea. So I will just do an introduction today like I did in the first service. Because I may not be able to finish what I intended to do in this service. Please allow me to introduce it and, 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 and I trust that you will get it, you'll get it right. So that when we, got into, we get into the details, it will not be difficult for you to follow. Now, the most important thing that these people needed was the presence of God. Because without the presence of God, it may not matter how smart you are, it will not matter the things that you know. It may not matter how endorsed, I mean, how endowed you are in the, in the matters that concern you. You will always require the presence of God to move you from step one to step two. This is why I've called this walking in step with God. Walking in step with God. And the question, second question is this. What was the presence of God in Israel at that moment? How many of us know what was or who was the presence of God at that moment in the land of Israel. Can somebody help me here? What was it? It was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. This is why the scripture says here, 
And he commanded the people, he said, as soon as you see the ark, as soon as your eyes see the ark of the covenant being carried by the priests or the Levitical priests, then you will arise from where you are and you will begin to follow that ark into the place where I am taking you. The Lord didn't tell them, as soon as you see a cloud coming like it was in the days of the wilderness, then you will begin to arise. No. He told them, when you see this very special thing that is called the ark of the covenant, when you see the priest carrying it, you will not take the guns and begin walking. No, he didn't say that. Or you'll take the matches and begin uh, 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 walking. No. He said, you will arise from where you are and you'll begin to follow it. The ark of the covenant. This is one of the things which many of us have no idea about. I asked in the first service, how many, of, how many people know what the Ark of the Covenant is? And I'm very sure from the, the response, there were a number who understood what the Ark of the Covenant is, but there were many who had no idea. And to many of us in the church today, we know the Ark is simply a box that Israel had in the tabernacle, which they were carrying along with them. But we have never fathomed or we have never understood or never un uh, uh, gotten to a point where we can understand the power that was in that box which Israel was carrying. Or what was it that was endured in that box which Israel was carrying. I want to attempt this morning just to bring an introduction to that box and help you to see what was it that this actually thing called the Ark of the Covenant contained and why Israel needed this Ark of the Covenant to walk with them wherever they were going. And to establish a point here, that without the presence of God in our lives, without God allow, us allowing God to lead us where we are going, without allowing you to be in the midst of the situations that we are faced with, the calamities that are following us, without us asking him to be behind us when we are walking, because the enemy is not only in front of us, it's not just in the middle of the things we are doing, the enemy is also behind us to try to pursue us and defeat us. So God provided Israel with a very special way of doing business. And this special way was Israel having this thing that is called the Ark of the Covenant. I'll attempt to explain what it was. This Ark, just to start with, was a very special box that God told Moses to build. A chest, we call it. A chest is like a, a small kind of a box that Israel actually made and they kept it in a place that we call the Holy of Holies. I think next time probably I'll have a a picture of uh, the tabernacle. I'll flash a picture of the tabernacle here. While they were in the wilderness leaving the land of Egypt, God told Israel, for all this time, I have spoken face to face with Moses. Okay? Because whenever God wanted to speak to his people, he would call Moses on the mountain, and he would sit with him there, commune with him, and he would send him back to the people to tell the people what he wanted. But it was in God's heart that he may commune with his people. He may be able to talk with his people himself. To be in the place where he can gather his people together and communicate with them and fellowship with them. So what did he do? He told Moses, Moses, go and ask the people to build me a tabernacle. A tabernacle is a meeting place, just like we are gathered here. This is a place where Jesus is meeting us together. I know he can meet you individually where you are, or he can meet you through your pastor. The pastor praying somewhere and calling you, or the pastor praying and coming to meet you. But the best way God wanted to do was to commune together with Israel together when they are gathered together. So what did God do? He told Moses, build me a tabernacle, a place of gathering. Some Bibles call it the place of gathering, where he would collect all the people of Israel, bring them together, and they would be able to worship him. And they would be able to, to, you know, you know, to adore him. They would be able to come together and fellowship with him. So he built this special building, which I won't go into details today, but I'll simply introduce it by telling you, it was a big, big place of meeting, a huge tent that had three compartments in it. Three compartments in it. There was the place where everybody would assemble, what we call as the outer court. A big tent, surrounded the way this house is surrounded, but the first compartment was a place we call the outer court. This was a place where all Israelites, everybody who is an Israelite would come in. They would come with their sins, they would come with their petitions, but most important, they were coming with the sacrifices which they were giving to God. I didn't mention here, in the first service I said, worship wasn't the way we worship today. You know, in, in those days, worship, worship wasn't singing songs. Coming and people saying, so and so, Sister Florence, lead us in a song. Then they sing their songs, then they give an offering of few shillings and they walk away. That wasn't their worship that time. Their worship was in sacrifices. People would carry a sacrifice. 
to appease for their sins. They would come to God not empty-handed. They would come into that place of, uh, of gathering, carrying, some were carrying sheep, others were carrying goats, others they were carrying doves, others were carrying turtles, and they would come and offer those offerings before the Lord in that place of gathering. Now, the, the outer court was an open area where everybody was allowed to come in. Anybody would come in. I would say that outer court would be the place like where we are gathered here. Because here, I don't know where you've come from. I may not know what you did yesterday. I may not know the situation that has, has brought you here. But all of us can come and gather together. That was the outer court. Of course, we'll talk about it sometimes later in the, in, in the year. It was a place of sacrifice where you would come and throw your sacrifice there. And ask the priest to take your sacrifice, offer it before the Lord, the priests before the Lord for, on your behalf, so that your sins may be forgiven. Now, beyond the outer court, thank you, thank you for bringing up that picture. Please, could you flash it again? Beyond the outer court, what we call the outer court here, outer court is the big place, you see? The big place, surrounded with uh, that, the, 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 the circumference of the tent. Outside the outer court, we had the place we call the holy place. The holy place was only limited to the Levites. These were the men that would serve, that were called in the service of God, the Levites. This place, not everybody went in. There were only the Levites, the sons of Levi that went there. And they had their own ministry, which maybe we'll talk about some other time, where there were things which they did there on behalf of the people. On behalf of the people. And I, I can mention here, many times many of us don't go beyond the outer court. By the way, many believers never go beyond the outer court. They only end up in the outer court. There are very few who can penetrate into the place of the inner court, where there is special ministry. If you see in the, in, in, in the inner court, we had bread there. Not many believers eat the bread that is served in the inner court. They only get a little crumbs outside here, and then they disappear and go. Now, beyond the, outer, the, the, the holy of holy, I mean the holy, we had now another place inside. All right? That place was called, somebody can help me, I wonder whether you're following. It was called what? The holy of holies. The holy of of holies. That's where I'm going to dwell for a moment from now. The holy of holies. Again, that place, the holy of holies, not everybody went there. It is only the high priest, that is Aaron, and whoever would inherit Aaron as the high priest, who was allowed to go into the holy of holies. And again, I want to mention here, not many of us go beyond the holy into the holy of holies. We, we are limited depending on how we relate with God and depending on how we connect with the holiness of God. This is why the place is called the Holy of Holies. Now, allow me not to go beyond that in, in introducing this tabernacle because if I go beyond that, I'll not share what I want to share. By the grace of God, I believe before the year ends, we'll explore the tabernacle. Right from outside up to the inside. But my limit now takes me into the place we call the Holy of Holies. And inside this place there was one thing that was inside there. That thing is that table that you are seeing there called the Ark of the Covenant. These other places had several items, had several things. Like outside we had the, the altar, we had the, the lava. If you move inside, there was the, 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 the candlesticks, we had the, sh the showbread, and we had also the incense. But when you go to the Holy of the Holies inside there, there was one box. That's the box I want to dwell on this morning. This box is the box I'm referring to here as the Ark of the Covenant. Only one box was there. One box. Which God told Moses, build me this box and place it inside that holy of holies. The box was inside there. Called the Ark of the Covenant. Now it is this box which God is telling Israel. When they are now living, they have just now been prepared to cross the, Red, I mean, I mean, I mean the river Jordan. And God is telling Israel, this box will not be placed inside the Holy of Holies now. The priests will take that box and they will carry it on their shoulders. And when they reach where the river is, they will, the priests who are carrying the box will be the first ones to cross with the box in that river. But he's telling Israel, when you see, when you will see the Ark of the Covenant, when you will see the Ark of the Covenant being carried by the priests, ready to cross that river, you arise and you follow it. Can I talk to GCI? Let me talk to the GCI here this morning. When you see the Ark of the Covenant, when you see the presence of God, when you see the Lord Jesus leading you and guiding you, when you will see the Lord Jesus carried out by the priests of the house, then begin to follow. Because you will need the presence of God to help you to reach the place where you are going. If you believe that, say amen. amen. 
Now, let me expound a little bit here. This was the most important, important, and I'm repeating, thing that Israel had in them advancing for conquest. There was no way they were going to conquer anything without the presence of God. And I want to encourage each one of us here this morning, it may not matter what you are or what you have, it will take the presence of God for you to get to the place where God wants you to get to. Our sister, Pastor, Pastor Joy, spoke here the other Sunday. And she talked about uh, going in your own, in, in, in your own without, without the Lord. I think she made, that, she made that very statement very clear here. When they were attacking the, the city of Aia, a very tiny city, but because God had abandoned them, God wasn't with them anymore. The Bible tells me they were beaten and they were hit back and they ran away. This time, they, God is telling Joshua, make sure, tell the people, when they just see you lift up that ark, when they see the presence of God being taken with you, please begin to arise and begin to follow. Now, this is not in my notes. I told the media team in the morning, but let me just come to this. I want to show you a few instances of Israel where they never acknowledged that box. They never, where they did or they didn't acknowledge that box and what happened. I'll give an example. First Samuel chapter 14 and verse 18, if you can write down Samuel. First Samuel 14 and verse 18. This is Saul in the days of Samuel. Saul is fighting the Philistines. You know, many times Saul, the Bible tells me in the reign of King Saul, they, they, the Philistines never ceased to wage war against the reign of King Saul, which means throughout the reign of King Saul, the biggest enemy King Saul had were the Philistines. But in this verse, chapter 14 and verse 8, Paul, Saul is going against the Philistines for the first time, and God has told him to go against the Philistines. And see what, what the Bible says in verse 18. First, Saul, first Samuel 14 and verse 18. These are the people. The Bible says all, chapter 14, verse 18. Are we there? First Samuel, that is Isaiah. First Samuel, I said first Samuel. 14 and verse 18. Just blow it up there, media. You're good people. It says, and Saul said to Ahia. Read with me. What did he tell Ahia? He said, bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. Go to verse 19 for people to understand what he was telling them. And it came to pass while Saul talked to the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Palestinians went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, with the draw thine hand. Now, here Saul was fighting with the Palestinians, with the Philistines. And then he remembered this box that I'm talking about, the ark. I think they had gone to war, but they, they, they had left this box into the place where it was placed. When they entered the land of Egypt, I mean the land of Canaan, there was a place called Shiloh. That's the place where this box actually was kept. It was like a, pla a place which God had appointed to become a station for the tabernacle. So as soon as Saul realized that they are going to war and they are, they are not carrying this box, I'm just telling you the importance of this box. What did Saul do? Again, back to verse 18. The Bible tells me Saul in verse 18, chapter 14, verse 18, he said unto, this man was the priest of that time. He said, bring here the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And believe me, when they brought the ark of God, things changed. Bring the ark of God. They needed the ark of God for the ark of God to help them to fight the battles which they were fighting. Now, if you go again to 1 Samuel chapter 4, I'm just quickly moving through this. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 3. This is a terrible time. 1 Samuel 4 and verse 3. The Bible tells me God has told Saul, Remember before, when Saul became king over Israel, Eli was the priest at that particular time. And Eli had his sons who were also priests. Saul now here is going to battle again with the Philistines. And this time Saul makes a mistake. He's going to fight with the Philistines, and Saul has forgotten, he has forgotten that the most important thing is not carrying the sword and carrying the armor and going outside there. The most important thing is the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark of the Covenant, there were, I'll, I'll come to that later, there were three things in that Ark of the Covenant, which I'll mention as I continue. One of the things there was the Ten Commandments, which is the Word of God. Number two, in that Ark of the Covenant, we had manna. And number three, in the same Ark of the Covenant, somebody help me here, there was the third thing, I want to know whether some of us can remember that. There was the rod of Aaron in that Ark, to signify different things that we'll look at in my next sermon. But Saul ignores the Word of God. 
He ignores the word of God. You can be carrying the ark of the covenant, but you are not doing what the Lord has told you to do. He ignored the word of God. God had told Saul certain things to do, and Saul wasn't doing those specific things that God had told him to do. In fact, this war that Saul was going to was a war which he was waging in rebellion against God. Because he had inquired of God and God had told Saul not to do it, but Saul was insisting he must go to that war. And indeed, God allowed him. You, you can just go and fight. And Saul went. Now, look, look at what is now happening here. The people have encamped and they are fighting. At, in verse 3, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3, if you go there, it says, And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Because the Lord allowed the Philistines to begin beating them up and smiting them. People began questioning, why has the Lord allowed these Philistines to smite us? Keep on reading and saying, it says this, before the Philistines. He said, let us, somebody help me here, let us do what? Fetch the ark of the, of the covenant of the Lord out in Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh amongst us, it may save us out of the hand of the what? Our enemies. To signify to you, this was what Israel needed, the presence of God. And believe me, child of God, you need the presence of God in your life. Can I repeat again? You need what? The presence of God in your life. So that people realize, look, we need God, we need God in this battle. But remember, the leader has actually committed sin, just like we were learning about Achan here. You can be in the church, you are carrying the presence of God, but you are still walking in sin. Believe me, when you walk in sin, even carrying that, ark, I mean, carrying that presence of God will not help you. Now, here they are telling Saul, we have left, can we go and fetch it? And indeed, these people went and they fetched out that covenant box and they came with it. But they didn't realize it was going to be tragedy. If you keep reading in verse 5, let's go just read through quickly. Verse 5, it says, verse 5, very quickly, uh, media, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5, if you can just flash it quickly. Verse 5 says, and when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Let's go to verse 6. Rang again. Verse 6. Verse 6. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. To signify to me, when the presence of God is there, people will know. They will know. Believe me. When the presence of God is with you, people will know. People will know. The enemy, the moment the ark came, people made a shout. And the Bible tells me the place was shaken. The Philistines saw the glory of God there. But they did not understand that that was actually God's presence with them. Keep on reading. Can you just keep on reading verse 7? And the Philistines were afraid. And so they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing here before. I'm simply emphasizing being in step with God. They could not have crossed the, Red, I mean the, 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 the river Jordan without the presence of God. That's what I'm emphasizing here. And believe me, church, you need that presence. 2024, you will not progress without it. It will not happen because you are a smart guy or a smart woman. I am very educated. I am an expert in this area. It will not happen because you have all the money that you need in the world. It is going to happen because the presence of God is with you. I won't go into details. I want to jump to verse, chapter, the same chapter. I want to jump to verse, verse 21 because my time won't allow me to go into details. Verse 21 of the same chapter 4, first somewhere. Verse 21. This verse tells me they have now fought with the Philistines and Saul has done so in rebellion because God didn't tell him he refused to obey God in certain areas as they were fighting this war. So what happens in verse 21? Verse 21 says, and she named a child. This child is called who? Ichabod. This is the story of Saul. Let me just narrate it a little bit before I come here. As they were fighting that war, the Bible tells me the Philistines beat Israel and defeated Israel. And they didn't do, they didn't do so because God's presence wasn't with them, no. They did so because Saul was acting out of rebellion acting out of rebellion. And then the Bible tells me, as they were fighting, the two sons of Eli, who was then the priest, they died. And the sad thing, because they had picked the ark from Shiloh, and they had brought it, brought it to the battlefield, the Philistines picked that ark and disappeared with it. They ran with it. Now, sad enough, as they were running with that thing, one of the fellows who had been in battle ran and went to report to Eli, the priest, the high priest. 
told Eli, listen, as we were in the battle, this and this has happened. Eli, who was the high priest, when he heard his sons had died in the battle, and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away, the Bible tells me he fell back on his, on, 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 the, on, on, on his back, collapsed, and he died. His daughter-in-law, a woman who had been married to his son, I'm just cutting the story short, who had been married to his son, when she saw, when she heard her father has died, father-in-law has died, and has, her husband, who was the son of Eli, is dead, this woman was carrying a baby. The Bible tells me early labor, she developed early labor, and she began to cry out. The Bible tells me in a moment of time, she delivered a baby, and the woman also died. But in the presence of delivering a baby, she, can you just take me to verse, 20, to verse 19, so that this story can be understood properly, verse 19. It says, and his daughter-in-law, had, his name was Fehanas, wife, uh, wife with a child, near to be delivered, when she heard that the, the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law, her husband was dead, she bowed herself and traveled, for her pains came upon her suddenly. In verse 20 tells me, and about the same time of her death, the woman that stood by her, her said unto her, fear not, for thou hast born a son, but she answered and said, answered not. Neither did she regard it, because she was already in a shock, and she was dying. Now, the verse I want you to get is verse 22. 22 says, and she named the child. What did she call the child? Ichabod. To signify what? Come on, can you read with me? Ichabod. To mean what? The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her, and her husband. And because of her father-in-law and her husband. Now, this woman called this baby Ichabod because her father-in-law had died. And the word Ichabod here simply means the glory has departed. Now, as long as the ark of God was in the proper place and according to the word which God had given Israel, it was God in their midst. And hear me right. As long as the ark of God is in the right place in our church and is in the right place in your heart, it is actually God in your midst. This little box, I'll come back to it now here. God had made a covenant with the children of Israel. This covenant was a conditional one. It was not just anything. Because today we have got people who believe the covenant doesn't have any meaning to anyone. It was a conditional one. It, me it meant this. If you do this, I will do this. If you obey me, I will bless you. His promise to them was from generation to generation that if they obey his laws, they will actually be blessed and they will have good in their lives and to their descendants in the years to come. Another condition was if you disobey me, like in the case of King Saul here, it was very clear punishment, despair, and dispassion will be your portion. Believe me, if there was anything that Israel was targeted after, I'm against, it was this thing I'm calling the Ark of the Covenant and the walls of Jerusalem. And number three, the temple in Jerusalem. And God says, the moment you do not regard me, my presence will leave you. As much as that was a box which God was contained in, the presence of God was literally in that box. And as long as they obeyed God and walked with him, that box contained his presence. But the moment they disobeyed God, the presence of God was lifted away from that box. And it remained a mere box with no presence of God in it. This way, when the Philistines took it, as far as it, as much as it was a very powerful thing, the presence of God had left Israel. It was a box somewhere in Philistia, but the presence that was in that box had already disappeared away from the children of Israel. To signify to me that we must always retain the presence of God in our lives. And ensure that we obey what God tells us to do and we obey his word. Now, in this place, in this box, quickly, in this box, I'm talking about the box. Can you flash the box, how it looked like? The media team. This is what the box looked like. This box was not just an ordinary box. It looked like that. It was called the Ark of the Covenant, like I've said. I said, and I want to repeat this here, when you enter the tabernacle, from the outside of the tabernacle, those, the big area in the tabernacle, the, the, the things which were in those... In, 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 in that big area, most of them were made of either raw wood or raw precious stone. Just raw. In the outer court. 
They were just natural things for natural people. But as you moved into the inner court, what we are calling as the holy place, everything in the holy place was plated with gold to signify as you moved closer to God, your value went up. Now listen to me. In the outer court, you are ordinary. All of us who came in the church this morning, ordinary. But as we move closer to God, from the outer court to the inner court, the Lord begins adding value to us. And we become more valuable than we were when we were coming in the house of God. But believe me, after the inner court, when you went into the innermost court, Ile and Dani Kabisa, the Bible tells me everything in the inner court was made of pure gold. To signify the beauty of our God. The purity of our God. The holiness of our God. To let me understand that God does not just allow anybody to be with him. God always will choose those whom he wants to be with him. If they are walking, truly walking in holiness. Now this thing, if you check it up, it had what I'm calling here, two cherubims on, on it. Two cherubims. Those cherubims are like angels. With their hands spread out, their wings spread out. To signify their readiness for service. Believe me, in the kingdom of God, angels have been designed for service of the saints. Angels have been designed to serve those who would be heirs of the eternal life. And they are always ready to be deployed outside there. To bring you good news or to bring you bad news. But in all cases, angels bring good news. Now, in that case there, those two angels, the Bible tells me they were cherubims. And these two angels, they had their wings spread out and they were facing one another. And they were simply made of pure gold to signify the purity of God and the power of God. Now, hear me this, because this is very important for you to note. That thing up there that we are calling cherubims there, that is where actually the presence of God was. That's where God sat. Look at the big picture of the tabernacle. From the outer space, almost the innermost space. God is now sitting in the innermost space. I'm assuming this is the innermost space where I'm standing here. And indeed it is. We have only one box here. And this box is where the presence of God sits on this box. I did mention. In the outer court, everybody was allowed. When you got the inner court... Only the priests were allowed. But when you go to the innermost courts, there was only one man who was allowed there. And his name was Aaron, the high priest. Thank God. And I'm saying thank God here. If you would say amen. amen. Because when Jesus came and died for us. And listen, something happened on the day he was dying. By the way, he was on Mount Calvary when he was dying there. The Bible tells me when he shouted and he said, it is finished. There was something which happened in the temple. Because in that temple, there were those portions, the outer court, the inner court, and the innermost court. There was a veil in the temple. A veil is like this piece of cloth that you are seeing here. Running, separating the outer court, I mean the inner court from the innermost court, the holies of holies. The moment Jesus said, it is finished, the Bible tells me that veil in the temple was torn from up, from, from top, to the bottom. It went wah. And the Bible tells me that veil opened so that everybody could see the Ark of the Covenant in the innermost place to signify to me that every believer had now a right for him to walk to God in the innermost places and receive attention from God in the innermost places. That's the reason why when you see this in our church, people have been asking many questions. Pastor Mlema, why have you put curtains in the church? This is not a decoration. And I've always said that this is not a decoration. This is to signify what happened on that day when Jesus died. To tell you the cross divided the veil. To show you that now we can approach this cross and nobody can come to this cross. And you can receive mercy in times of what? Of need. Now listen, that thing you see seated there, and I'm coming to that point, it was called the mercy seat. Go and read it was called the mercy seat. Because that is the place where God dispensed mercy on his people. Once in a year, the high priest would carry the blood of all, everybody. Your blood of the sins you've committed. He would carry the blood of the nation. And the high priest understood, even he himself was a sinner. 
But God will tell the high priest, before you walk in the holy, of pl holy places, you make sure you have sanctified yourself. You made yourself so clean that when you walk inside there, I will not impute any sin upon you. But I came to learn, the high priest being just a normal person, there, were, there was a possibility he also had committed some sins which he didn't know. Because some of us, we have sins that we, have, we, have, we, have, we do that we have no idea about. So when he was carrying that blood, the blood contained his own sins and the sins of the nation. And he would walk inside the tent through the curtain. The moment he's inside the tent there, he would carry the blood and pour it on top of that mercy seat there. And then God would, he would receive that blood and he would forgive the sins of the nation, what we are calling here as the day of atonement. I'm happy to let you know. They were, it was blood of animals. It was blood of bulls and blood of cows. But the Bible tells me Jesus has given his blood once and for all. That you don't need to offer the blood of bulls anymore. You don't need to offer the blood of cows anymore. He has already given his blood on the cross. So that now, friend, you are free from any sin that you ever committed. But remember, it cannot happen unless you walk in the three things that were in that tabernacle. This stone there, that table contained three things. Before I go to the three things, which I will introduce to you next week, because my time won't allow me, I want to notify you this. Even the priest who went inside there, he went there trembling. He went there fearful. The Bible tells me the priest would be, they would tie a rope on his foot when he's entering the Holy of Holies. You know the reason why? So that in case he enters there with sin, and the man collapses there, when he's doing his ministry there, the people will be able to do what? To pull him with a string. Because nobody was allowed inside there when you are carrying sin. The priest would also be having some bells around his, his, uh, his tunic. That time they used to wear gowns. There were bells around his tunic. When he's doing ministry, the priest would be doing it while he's shaking his hands. So that the bells would be ringing. And people outside are listening. When they hear the ringing of the bells, they know our pastor is safe. Are you getting my point? When the bells end, they know the pastor has done what? Is dead. They would pull him. That is how serious, I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant. How the presence of God was so serious to signify to me, if there is anything Israel needed to cross the, Red sea, I mean the River Jordan, they needed the presence of God. And my friend, you need the presence of God. Because that is not just any ordinary power. Believe me, when God is with you, you will walk through the storms. You will walk through the rivers. And there is nothing that will stand in your way that, will not, that you will not be able to do. Allow me to finish. I was just doing an introduction here. I have, four, I have just about 40 seconds to do. My clock is telling me here I've got 0.36. By the way, this is not just a speaker. There is, it is warning me here. It's telling me stop. So I'm going to stop now in another 29 minutes. I think it must be zero. Or is it finished? Oh, it is finished. It is finished. Um, I, I have eaten your 21 minutes. So let me just redeem the... Oh, oh no, no, it's not... Oh, yes, I've eaten 21 minutes. Let me just say this. Not 21 minutes. I've eaten your 17 seconds. Okay? Let me finish by telling you this. You need the presence of God. Turn to your neighbor, tell him you need the presence of God. Without the presence of God, you can do nothing. Tell him. And I'll say this. Why they did that was the priests were to pick God himself. Pick God, that Ark of the Covenant, on those stakes that they are carrying. And they were to walk with God as they are leaving the east of Jordan. We will see it next Sunday. As they were crossing the Jordan, the Bible tells me God told the priests, when you step in the water, something will happen. And indeed, when they stepped in the water, the Bible tells me the, land, the, the waters were done what? They were parted. But listen, the priest walked as the people were following them in step with God until they went in the middle of the river Jordan. In the middle of the river Jordan, they did not cross to the other side, by the way. The people were very many. They stopped there and they waited for the people to do what? To cross. To signify to me, God will be ahead of you to walk with you. And then God will stand in the midst of your problems and allow you to do what? Pass. And after you pass, God will follow behind you to protect you from any other enemy that may come behind you. Yeah. That is what God did for Israel. And I promise you in 2024, the Lord will be before you. Yeah. 
the Lord will be in the midst of your challenges. And the Lord will come behind every challenge that you're going to face in this year, 2024. I will stop at that, put a comma, we'll pick it from there, and I will tell you what was in that box that you must know to enable you to continue to receive your conquest in the year 2024. Thank you for listening to me. You may stand up on your feet. Worship team, please come.